the brain, specifically the cerebrum portion. The large number of things you need to know from the cerebrum has to do with the wide expanse of things that occur across the cerebrum. We can see a general synopsis here of a range of functions of the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the most recognizable portion of the brain with its two sides or hemispheres. The surface pattern of the rounded gyri and the crevices of the sulci in between. The entire surface containing the gray and white matter that makes up the gyri and sulci is called the cerebral cortex. This is literally where we do our thinking. Our cerebrum is mostly concerned with our experiences of sensation, movement, and mental processing beyond what is essentially required to keep our body functioning. The cerebrum is made of gray and white matter. The gray matter is where the synapses or neural connections occur, where one neuron sends a signal to another neuron. In these gray areas, we find the following parts of neurons, cell bodies, dendrites with receptors, as well as the axon terminals of another neuron with neurotransmitters. The main areas of gray matter are the basal nuclei and the surface of the cerebral cortex. The white matter of the brain are where the tracks where information is transmitted across bundles of axon, bringing information from one part of the brain to the other. These tracks will terminate in areas of gray matter before connecting on to another neuron and moving elsewhere. The white matter is like the wiring of the brain and are indicated by the tracks in this MRI image. The primary regions of the cerebrum that contain the white matter are the tracks extending out to each hemisphere from the thalamus as well as the corpus callosum that goes side to side from one hemisphere to the other. There are five main lobes of the brain that are roughly anatomically defined. The frontal lobe is the most anterior portion of the brain. This lobe is the main source of motor impulses and higher order thinking, which is things like goal planning or understanding consequences. Posterior to that is the parietal lobe, which is the main area to consciously process sensory information. The very posterior portion of the brain is the occipital lobe where we process the visual information received by the eyes. Inferior lateral lobes are the temporal lobes that process the sense of smell, hearing, and equilibrium in addition to significant features for memory. The surface of the cerebrum are the fissures and prominent sulci, which are not as deep as fissures. The longitudinal fissure divides the brain into right and left halves. The central sulcus separates the front lobe from the parietal lobe. The lateral sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the anterior portion of the temporal lobe, while the parietal occipital sulcus is a very deep, dividing the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe and internal portions of the temporal lobe. In a brain of an Alzheimer's patient, you can see the dramatic reduction in brain mass. The deep cracks formed by the sulci are much more prominent. Regions associated with memory, language, and sometimes smell are severely affected. Now let's look at functional regions. These are regions that are not necessarily anatomically defined, but are more just general areas. The functional regions of the brain are centers that are responsible for certain actions or sensations. These regions are within lobes and sometimes cross over across the lobes, starting with voluntary muscle control centers. The central sulcus is the division between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. On the anterior side is the precentral gyrus, more specifically known as the primary motor cortex. This gyrus is divided into regions that are dedicated to controlling voluntary skeletal muscles of specific areas of the body. The larger the area on this gyrus for a specific area, the more control you have over that area, often due to a large number of smaller motor units. These are regions with fine touch and small precise movements such as the muscles that control the fingers and facial expressions. When viewing the primary motor cortex from a frontal slice, you can see the top of the brain around to the side. The largest sections are dedicated to moving the fingers, 
facial expressions, and throat for swallowing and speaking. Anterior to the primary motor cortex is the premotor cortex. This region is where programs or patterns of movements are stored. Learning and training develops neuronal connections in this area. The premotor cortex then activates specific neurons from the primary motor cortex to create the movement desired. Specific to motor control of voluntary muscles, the plan for the movement begins at the premotor cortex, which elicits specific parts of the primary motor cortex. Neurons from the primary motor cortex descend to the body. Neurons from the primary motor cortex will descend to the body at the medulla oblongata, the majority of the neurons will cross over to the opposite side, then continue to descend and down the spinal cord and exit via the anterior horn of the spinal cord on the opposite side. The area dedicated for forming speech and the muscles involved in making sound for the purpose of communication is adjacent to the mouth and throat area of the primary motor cortex. This region is known as Broca's area and is found on only one side of the brain, most often the left hemisphere. This area connects the muscles of the mouth, airway, tongue, soft palate, and respiratory muscles to produce speech. The frontal eye field is a region anterior to the premotor cortex that controls eye movements. The eye movements from this region are voluntary scanning of an area Involuntary movements originate in other regions of the brain, noticeably the occipital cortex and superior colliculi of the midbrain. Using the worksheet style diagram, you can label and identify the function of the motor region of the brain within the frontal lobe. Just anterior to the central sulcus is the primary motor cortex that controls the muscles of the body. The premotor cortex plans the movement sequence and activates the primary motor cortex. Broca's area controls the muscles used to form words, while the frontal eye field controls the eye movement for voluntary scanning of an area. Now let's look at some sensory processing centers. There are many regions of the brain that sensory information is directed to then interpreted so that we can be aware of the world around us. The three main sensation types that we will map out in the brain are somatic, sensations from the body, vision, and hearing. Somatic senses are sensations received from the body that include pain, touch, pressure, temperature, and body position or proprioception. There are many types of sensory receptors in the body. Most of these will be covered in other chapters. Sensations from the right side of the body is transmitted to the left side of the brain, vice versa. Left side of the body is transferred to the right side of the brain. All sensory information from the body arrives at the thalamus on the opposite side where the sensation was felt to be directed to the appropriate location on the cerebral cortex for awareness of that sensation. Posterior to the central sulcus is the area dedicated to somatic sensations within the parietal lobe. On the posterior side of the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus, more specifically known as the primary somatosensory cortex. This gyrus is divided into segments that map out sensations from specific areas of the body. The larger the area on this gyrus for a specific area, the greater sensitivity from that area there is due to the high concentration of sensory receptors on those parts of the body. The fingertips and face are very sensitive and have greater space dedicated on this gyrus to receive sensations from the many different receptors located there. The brain's perspective of our bodies based on the amount of space dedicated to specific areas of the body is disoriented to reality. A sensory homunculus is a figure that has the size of body parts proportional to the dedicated space along the primary somatosensory cortex. This is a visual representation of the number of sensory receptors in a given area with the largest proportions to the lips and hands. Once sensations of touch, 
pressure, pain, temperature, body position, among others, arrive at the primary somatosensory cortex, it is then processed in a region along the posterior superior border. This region is the somatosensory association area where understanding of what you are feeling is taking place. This region utilizes life experiences in the form of memories to evaluate what you're touching and establishing meaning. For example, you could discern between a nickel and a button just by touching it. The feeling you experience touching those objects are sent to the primary somatosensory cortex, but knowing the difference in what it means is the result of the processing by the somatosensory association area. Sensory input into the brain arrives at the thalamus where it is directed to the primary somatosensory cortex in addition to the basal ganglia, cerebellum, and other regions. The somatosensory association area then makes sense of the incoming information by interpreting the various sensations. Using the worksheet style diagram, you can label and identify the function of the two main somatic sensory regions of the brain within the parietal lobe. Just posterior to the central sulcus is the primary somatosensory cortex directly receiving body sensations. The somatosensory association area interprets these signals. Vision is one of our special senses that will be discussed in more detail in a subsequent chapter. The portion of the cerebrum that processes visual information from the eye is the current focus. Visual stimuli travel to the occipital lobe. The primary visual cortex receives information from both eyes on both hemispheres of the brain. The primary visual cortex receives information about the light intensity, color, and depth to make a visual image of what the eyes are directed at. Surrounding the primary visual cortex is the visual association area. Interpretation of what is being seen is processed in the visual association area. The size of this area can differ from person to person and is not as clearly defined as the primary visual cortex. The pathway for vision begins at the optic nerve that receives information from the retina of each eye. On the undersurface of the brain is a prominent feature that looks like an X. This is called the optic chiasm. This is where half of the visual field from each eye splits to go to the opposite side of the brain. This is important because it allows both sides of the brain to receive information from each eye. In the event one eye is damaged, the other eye can still send visual information to both sides of the brain. Once the visual information from each eye is combined, it enters the brain via the optic tracts to synapse at the thalamus. The thalamus then directs the visual information to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. This information is then interpreted by the visual association area. Using the worksheet style diagram, you can label and identify the function of the visual regions of the brain within the occipital lobe. The most posterior point of the cerebrum, the primary visual cortex, receives basic visual information. The visual association area uses memory and experience to interpret what you are seeing. Hearing is another one of our special senses that will be discussed in more detail in a subsequent chapter. The portion of the cerebral cortex that receives the sensation from the ear and its interpretation is the current topic. The primary auditory cortex receives information from the inner ear regarding the volume and pitch or tone of a sound. This information is processed and interpreted by the area inferior to this known as the auditory association area. The vestibulocochlear nerve brings the hearing and equilibrium information into the medulla oblongata where the impulses continue to the thalamus. The thalamus then directs the hearing nerve impulses of pitch and volume to the primary cortex of the temporal lobe. The auditory association area then interprets the sounds that is heard based on experience and memory.
other areas of the brain also receive auditory information, such as the inferior colliculi, to help direct the head to the source of a sound for better hearing. Using the worksheet style diagram, you can label and identify the function of a few auditory regions of the brain within the temporal lobe. The primary auditory cortex receives basic auditory information. The auditory association area uses memory and experience to interpret what is being heard. Just posterior and adjacent to the primary auditory cortex is Wernicke's area. This region is specific to the left hemisphere and interprets language so that we understand the words that we hear. Creating and understanding language uses several interconnecting parts of the brain. Broca's area in the frontal lobe controls the muscles used to speak. These include airway or respiratory muscles, muscles controlling the vocal cords, as well as the formation of the shape of the mouth and placement of the tongue. The formation of words occurs on the left hemisphere. Understanding of words or language also takes place on the left hemisphere. In the region that includes the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes, this is known as Wernicke's area. This is where somatic, visual, and auditory information come together to understand language in written or verbal form. These two areas are also interconnected. We can see them in isolation here. Broca's area in the turquoise and Wernicke's area in yellow. On the right hemisphere, there is no specific name for the regions analogous to Broca's or Wernicke's in the dotted orange. These are referred to as affective language areas. In the anterior affective language in blue, emotion or sarcasm is put into words that we say, working in conjunction with Broca's area. The posterior region in orange is where one would comprehend the emotion in sarcasm in the words that they hear or read. For example, a person gets a flat tire while driving to work and explains, oh, that's just great, now we'll be late. The person saying those words is using the right side effective language area for Broca's to inject sarcasm and anger into the words spoken. A passenger hearing those words would use Wernicke's area to understand the literal meaning. The left hemisphere where Wernicke's is located would inform them that the person speaking is happy about being late and uses the term great. However, the right hemisphere's effective language area would be able to correctly interpret the words spoken to understand the sarcasm and the meaning is frustrated and the word great implies frustration and unhappiness. To simplify the language areas of the brain, consider the left side like a robot and functions very literally. Broca's area forms words and Wernicke's area understands words. The right side takes emotion into consideration and can add or understand emotion in the context of the words. The ability to process complex thoughts, including future planning, is considered to be a human quality. The anterior portion of the frontal lobe is where we derive our personality traits, our ability to plan ahead, incorporating past experiences, and learning into projecting future behavior. In this region, we develop self-control and situational awareness, as well as our impact on others. The process that occurs in this region of the brain is the basis for most of human behavior and the basis for the field of psychology. The most famous brain patient also contributed significantly to the study of human behavior by the frontal lobe. Phineas Gage was a railway worker. Some reports indicated he was a man well respected and looked up to and was likely in a leadership position. An explosion shot a three foot long, inch and a quarter wide rod through his mouth and up and out of his skull. He eventually lost the function of his left eye due to subsequent infection. His survival was remarkable, but he was a changed man in his personality and behavior.
Phineas lived for 12 more years and was a celebrity in his time for the tragedy that he experienced. This occurred in 1848. His skull was requested to be exhumed by his first attending physician and was subsequently given to Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard Medical School, where it remains its most popular attraction. Phineas Gage traveled around with the metal rod that impaled him, which also was given to the Anatomical Museum after his death. This is the functional areas of the brain worksheet completely filled out. I recommend you start from a blank one, identify all of the regions indicated, and then be able to mark for each of those regions indicated what each region is responsible for. So you should know the main functional regions and lobes of the brain. You should know the role of the white matter region, corpus callosum. You should know the divisions of the cerebrum, motor areas and higher order thinking areas of the frontal lobe, somatosensory areas of the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe functions and regions, the visual areas of the occipital lobe, and understand the location and functions of the language integrative areas.